I recently bought this iPod Nano first generation on eBay and the battery was dead. So I took it apart to replace it. And um, I don't actually have the replacement battery yet. So I was thinking, what should I do in the meantime? And I realized there's probably room for a USB-C port in here. So this iPod has two different places where the flash chip can be soldered on. Uh, presumably, sometimes they solder both for like two two gig um, chips to make up four gigs. This one's actually four gigs, and um, if you look closely, they've put the two flash chips on top of each other, like a little sandwich. And I guess it's cheaper to make like that. But what it means is we've got this whole uh, space here free, and this is a USB C port, and it's going to fit just like that. And if you're wondering where I got this port from, um, I bought a bunch of these on eBay, which is a uh, micro USB to USB-C adapter. And that's really handy because if you take it apart, it has this little circuit board inside, which all it does is connects the pins together that need to be connected together. And it also has a tiny little surface mount resistor, which makes um, the USB-C power supply that you plug it into detect the device and start feeding it power. Before I take the 30 pin connector off the board, I'm gonna take some time to see if I can find the USB data lines on the motherboard because I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to solder directly to the pads on 30 pin um, because the USB-C port is gonna be covering them up. Before we can put the USB-C connector on the board, we've obviously got to take the 30 pin connector off. And doing this with a soldering iron would be pretty difficult. I'd risk ripping up the pads or damaging this little connector right here, which is probably very delicate. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna try and cut as much of the connector off as I can with these wire cutters. And hopefully I won't damage the motherboard in the process. Oops. Well, I can't say I recommend this method. I've now prepared the board to accept the USB connector. So a 30 pin connector is gone, obviously. And you may notice all of the pads, except for one, have been ripped off, which is not ideal, but it doesn't matter because we can get the traces we need on the other side. So I've scraped some of the copper, uh, not copper, I've scraped some of the solder mask off the board to reveal the copper. And that is gonna let the, um, USB-C connector to be soldered on quite securely to the ground plane there. And I've also wicked some of the solder off the pads, the unused pads for the flash chip. You'll notice the pads on the other side, they're still kind of round and shiny, whereas these ones are flat, which means we're going to be able to get the USB 
connector flatter onto the board. I am going to have to put something on top to insulate them because I don't think it will be very happy with them shorted out against the shielding of the USB connector. So this is a diagram of how I wired up the USB connector. Thankfully I figured out where all the pads were before I ripped the 30 pin connector off the motherboard because if the pads aren't there it's kind of difficult to probe with the multimeter. So the way I found them was to plug in a standard 30 pin USB cable and put my multimeter in continuity mode to probe against the contacts until I found which ones were connected. So I finally finished with the soldering part. Um, I did that off camera because it's pretty difficult to set up the camera. So um, USB power and USB ground are both going to a couple of wires on the front side of the circuit board and the USB data lines are both going to the back of the board. And in order to get everything to fit inside the iPod, um, it fits together like this. And um, this chip here, which handles the uh, click wheel sensing, um, it was kind of getting in the way. So I've had to grind down the right hand side of it with the Dremel uh, to get everything to all fit. I probably took about half a millimeter off. And I covered it with some capped on tape because I don't want any of the legs or uh, other components to short out on the underside of the USB connector. Now because I don't have the battery yet, I haven't been able to put everything back together fully to test it, but I've tested it with another battery and it does work, it does sync up over USB. The next thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to fill up the rest of the front bezel with epoxy so that there isn't a big hole in the front of the iPod when it's back together. So what I've done is I've basically just taped on a bunch of paper and that paper is forming a very makeshift mold um, to basically hold a channel of epoxy in the front of this bezel. And I'm using part of a zip tie to mix this together because I couldn't find anything else. It's probably really bad for me, but I do like the smell of epoxy. And this is five minute epoxy, so I've got to be pretty quick. I think this is probably about as well mixed as it's going to get. So time to start dolloping. There's enough in there, I think. So now I'm just going to balance it vaguely upright. Fast forwarding a couple of days into the future and the epoxy is set and the new battery has arrived and I've soldered it in and now it's finally time to close up the casing. So this is the finished product, and I have to say I'm really pleased with how it's turned out. The external finish is really clean, 
the case closes nicely, there's no gaps. And um, of course it works. I've got a standard USB-C wall charger here, and if I plug it in, you can see the charging icon lights up there. And I'll have a demo of it syncing with iTunes in just a sec. But yeah, I'm really pleased with that. So just as a quick demo, I've got it plugged into iTunes here. And to prove it's still working, I'm gonna restore it again. And there we go, that is a fully functioning iPod. And if I plug it into iTunes again, it should pop up.